It's, um, it's a slightly ironic title, actually. Um, and it's there because I spent a lot of my life talking to people in the corporate world about social media and banging on about Twitter and blogging and other things like that. And there's always this kind of grown up reaction of, oh, that's not real work, which I'm getting more and more grumpy about. And I kind of push back and say, okay, so real work. Real work is sitting in meetings all day that never agree anything, or writing 40 page reports that nobody's ever going to read. And it's kind of occurred to me over the last couple of days just how little we've talked about that world of real work. Because that's where most people, I guess in most of the Western world, spend their working days. In, in big corporates, grinding stuff out, not quite sure why, facing all sorts of quite dysfunctional behaviours, you know, the sort of bullying, the macho, the, the disparaging, the disapproving, the whatever. And that's, I guess, where I, I spent a lot of my life tilting against, if you like. Alongside something else that's just occurred to me, just this moment before we kind of came on and started talking, was one of the participants came up to me and said, oh, I, was, I didn't realise you were special. <laughs> 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 I was talking to you the other night as if you were one of the ordinary ones. <laughs> and in fact, when I phoned my wife last night and told her about some of the amazing, wonderful people we've heard and some of the stories that we've heard, she said, what are you going to talk to them about? <laughs> in, the w in the way that only a wife can. Um, <laughs> so... Brief, we've been asked to tell a bit of our, of our, of our story, a bit of background how I ended up here. And it's funny hearing Sir Tim talk about his early days with his father with computing. My dad worked in computing. Uh, he was head of computer systems for a big local authority. So I grew up with punch cards for scrap paper. Uh, I remember when they printed out an ASCII Santa Claus with reindeer and a sled, being, being gobsmacked that a computer could do something so complicated <laughs> and, and fun. And then in 84, he got the first Mac Classic, which he brought home, and that thing of moving the mouse and having the... Having, in fact, I saw a video recently of Steve Jobs showing off that first Mac and having the thing talk at you and be able to move a mouse and do drawings, and, and I was never really quite the same since. But then I went off and tried to kick the system and became a professional musician for a couple of years, playing in clubs and working men's clubs in Lanarkshire and standing up playing sax in front of 400 minors um, who are much harder than you. I have to say, no matter what songs you play, no matter how well you play, that first half an hour they will all just sit there and glower at you until they get drunk enough to start dancing. Um, and then through that I got into sound, got into the BBC in a clerical post, uh, was a sound engineer for the World Service, mixing programmes, making live programmes for 47 different languages going on all around the world and seeing stories, hearing stories from amazing people all around the world and meeting people from all sorts of different cultures. And then moved back into the television centre where I come from that very purposeful, very um, flat, because people were climbing different ladders against different walls, world, into the very tribal world of telecentre, <coughs> where people, there's hierarchy, certain programme makers are higher up the food chain than others, and craft people and engineers are down at the bottom somewhere. And then saw so it transitioning from the old sort of home county civil service kind of place it was when I started, where the manager would come and put his tweed jacket over the back of a seat and then fuck off and let you get on with stuff, to the time when John Burt arrived and turned into this kind of efficient thing with lots of managers and lots of businesses and lots of processes and stuff. And I remember being in my first managerial role and I was managing some of the film and videotape editors who many of them had just been made redundant and a really torrid period of emotional turmoil. I'm feeling terrified at this idea of being a manager and having this responsibility as it was seen. And I started wearing a tie and talking funny <laughs> as a kind of protection. You know, I started talking words like process and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then realised I was on a slippy slope, that I didn't want to go down that slippy slope. And many managers keep going down that slippy slope and end up being that person, being that suit-wearing, tie-wearing person who talks funny and who doesn't then relate to people. So that's a kind of, kind of long kind of ramble towards what I'm going to talk about, which is actually the use of social media in organisations. And the point of the background was that the purpose of it was to kind of try and push back some of that corporateness, some of that inhumanness that I'd, I'd seen uh, take place. So I got called the Director of Knowledge Management 
director of the BBC. And as my dad said, how can somebody so stupid be the director of knowledge management? <laughs> But a dreadful job title. But, and I think people assumed I was going to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on documentum and document management systems, all these knowledge repositories. But PricewaterhouseCoopers Price call their knowledge repositories knowledge coffins because it's where knowledge goes to die. So I didn't want to capture and store other people's badly written documents. I wanted to enable what this sentence from the Clue Train to me summed up about the internet, that it was about globally distributed, near-instant, person-to-person conversations. Not about technology, not about clicks and mortar, not about whatever, but just about that. And the different elements of that were very pertinent to me in the big, big bureaucratic organisation. The globally distributed thing. I mean, yes, we can connect with Iranian and Chinese bloggers, we can share ideas with people behind all sorts of geographical and political boundaries, but it was ridiculously hard for my editors to talk to the editor in the cutting room next door to them. Because we'd taken away the shared spaces, we'd taken away the free time where they could chat over a beer, and many of them were, even 10 years ago when I started getting into this, were spending more time on bulletin boards on the web talking to other editors and other companies than they were to the person next door to them. So there's this ridiculous disconnect going on. So the ability to cross some of that with the technology appealed to me. The near instant aspect of it is something that still really troubles lots of corporates. And in fact, broadcasters like the BBC, I mean, one of, one of my friends was in the uh, King's Cross train when the bombs went off. And like many, he was coming out with his mobile phone taking pictures. Or like most, he was uploading them immediately to Flickr. He was tagging them, which makes them an even smaller minority, with the phrase London bombs. And within an hour and a half, Wired had got in touch and asked if they could use his pictures on their front page on, on the internet. At the same time, BBC journalists were being kept away from anything interesting by the emergency services. We didn't trust them with fancy phones. And even if they'd had fancy phones, they couldn't have got the pictures back through the firewall. So that whole thing about the fact that John at that moment with that phone was more powerful, briefly, than the biggest broadcaster, whatever, is interesting. And that's what scares a lot of them. And it became apparent that once you start unleashing these tools inside the firewall, as I did, they get even more scared because suddenly news just travels really quickly. So at our forum, which I'll show you in a moment, when something happened that was interesting, we all started talking about it. Loads of people talking about it. People who were actually involved in things were talking about it. So that when internal comms then sent the all-staff email telling us the truth, we all went, yeah, we know. Or actually, no, that wasn't the truth, because we've already been talking about it and we're better informed than that sanitised thing you just sent round. So that speed is, is, is a challenge. But the reassuring thing to me, and I think what eventually gets people comfortable, and, and nowadays I get asked to go and try and help other big bureaucratic international type organisations to get their heads around this. The reason that I can eventually make them feel comfortable is that it's about people. It's about person-to-person -person conversations. It's about establishing relationships. And that's one of the interesting things about, about the word social. You know, corporates get really jumpy about the word social. You know, I've had people say to me, I could never use the word social in executive meetings. They wouldn't take me seriously. Because we've sanitised that out. We've taken that sort of messy human relationship-based thing out. So when they hear you using that word, they have visions of unleashing the nightmare of all these teenage nutters kind of like spouting themselves out onto Facebook or whatever. And in fact, in my last workshop that I did inside the BBC before, before I got made redundant, actually funny story about being made redundant, about a week before, I'm the director of knowledge management, a week before I got made redundant, I got asked to take part in a high level meeting about how to prevent knowledge leaving the organisation. <laughs> 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 you, couldn't, you couldn't make it up, could you really? <laughs> but the, 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 um, this, this sense that they're trying to keep the lid on something, and that's the last meeting at the BBC, there was a manager in the front row sitting there in his suit looking really grumpy as I'm doing my bit, and he barely let me finish before his hand shot up, and he said, I could never trust my staff to use these tools, they would all end up wasting their time. So I was feeling a bit truculent that I was about to leave, and I said, have you ever thought that your recruitment policy might not be working? You're employing untrustworthy morons. As soon as you turn your back, they're going to start misbehaving. And then I said, well, this thing about wasting time is a moot point. You know, people have always found ways to waste time. Staring out the window, spending too long having a fag, going to have a coffee. Unlike all those other ways, I can quantify how much time they're wasting with these tools. I can show you when they log on, when they log off, and how much crap they talked in between. And then you manage them, because that's your job as a manager. So he still didn't like this. And eventually said, OK, how do you spend your working days? And he said, I go to lots of meetings. So it's going to back to some of the stuff David talks about. The fact that this sense of busyness of work 
of going home after a hard day with all these to-do lists that you know you're never going to do is somehow important. Um, part of it's, and that's a photograph of John Knox, um, the kind of Calvinist preacher from my part of the world, and having grown up with a Presbyterian elder of the Church of Scotland as a mother, um, I know the whole thing about disapproval. And, uh, <laughs> and I find I did a piece, in, I think, in France recently where I did a whole thing about what I called the price of pomposity. And it's that thing when you've got a nascent idea and a daft thing, and you just kind of like reveal it and somebody just kind of like squishes it. And, you know, senior people are really good at this. That's kind of talk to the hand, I'm the growing up kind of thing. And a kind of personal painful story about this, my dad, bless him, no harm to him. He didn't, you know, know what he was doing. But I had done some sort of thing, visioning of the future, what I might want to do with my life. And I actually quite fancy running retreats in the Pyrenees for senior folks, taking them long walks, giving them good food and showing them the world. And I sort of revealed this to dad. And he said, you'd have to be special to do something like that, son. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and I'm, I'm 40 at this time, you know, so that was just... <laughs> I'm, I'm back in my shorts again. It was terrible. <laughs> so again, it's this thing. I mean, my, 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 my own personal blog's called The Obvious because it's me overcoming my reticence about stating the obvious. And I'll sort of come back to it. But several people over the kind of last couple of days, have sort of, there's been this tone of, oh, yeah, there's all this crap on the internet. And it always worries me when people say that. Because, you know, one person's crap is somebody else's heartfelt, you know, it's okay, there's some out and out crap, let's be honest. But, you know, <laughs> as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, no, too, you kidding? But, you know, <laughs> it's a moot point that I'll come back to. Um, a lot of it's this fear of, that's a gonk, by the way, a troll, of trolling, of, of deliberately outward malicious antagonism. And both inside and outside the firewall. And, you know, I've seen our forum at the Beeb was fantastic. It was really robust and people really went for it and talked about all sorts of stuff in a way that was toe-curdlingly worrying for me. You know, I'm supposedly in charge of this thing. And they're talking about Brazilian pubic hair trimming and stuff on this forum that's meant to be a work-based forum. And I thought, you can't talk about this kind of stuff. But the fear was that this would suddenly just get out of hand, you know, and that we couldn't allow this to happen. And equally with... You know, people facing out towards clients, they're all terrified of somebody having a go at their product or their service or their behaviour or whatever. And one of the uncomfortable bottom lines that you get to with this stuff, and it was Dave Weiner who invented RSS, came up with the one liner that is, if you don't want me to slag off your product on the internet, don't have a shit product. <laughs> Again, that fear of trolls inverts itself into actually what you're so scared of, you know, what you're so worried about. All of this paranoia and fear and uncertainty is backed up by IT. I mean, that's the really, really sad thing for me. And, you know, the potential that Tim was talking about of technology and the ability to do wonderful things, it's ended up in, this, in the hands of this bunch of anal fascists, which I just don't understand. I mean, these are, these are guys who could be enablers, who could be giving people all this capability and, 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 and growth and fun, and they just say no to everything that's not Microsoft or that's not safe. And in fact, you know, <laughs> the head of security strategy at the BBC once did this speech about how there was a risk of information leaking out of the organisation. <laughs> and I said, we're broadcasters, for God's sake. <laughs> 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 it's, what, it's, what, it's what they pay us for, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so for my sins, next month I'm about to go on a boat in the channel, the Oriana, with 2,000 directors of IT. <laughs> stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what's going to hit them. Anyway, a um, couple of other things about the kind of stuff you learn out of doing this. is One is, is messiness. So I sort of touched on that earlier. <sighs> a lot of management has been about tidying things up and making things look organised. But actually, you begin to realise what a lot of that's done is just kill signal. You know, I, I began to realise you wanted... You need signal to noise in, in order to get lots of signal. You want lots of noise. You know, so if you try and make everything look tidy, all you're doing is killing some of the potential signal and you miss stuff. So uh, an inherent characteristic of these tools is you want lots of conversations, you want lots of inanity, you want lots of stuff happening, so you then get some signal. And you get better tools to find that signal. And it became apparent to me when we were putting these tools in, and just to sort of touch on that, putting the tools into the bee, we took the approach that it was in ecology. You know, it was lovely hearing uh, Peter talking about soil and stuff, 
As if there wasn't enough shit in the BBC, I was piling, no. Um, but it's, it's the idea of fertile networks and stuff was what I was heading for. And the analogy I, we began to use was Cotswold Villages, which grow up randomly and haphazardly. Nobody pre predetermines the architectural style, but they sort of work. And you know where the church is, where the pub is, and there's well-worn paths, and you feel comfortable hanging around in the street corners, chatting to people. Most corporate IT systems are like Milton Keynes. You know, efficient on the face of it, with lots of straight roads and roundabouts, and highly designed, with lots of kind of thought behind it. But I get lost every time I'm in Milton Keynes, even with a sat-nav. And I don't always feel like standing around chatting on street corners. So there's, again, a contrast here that... that the fear of messiness is actually losing potential for, for something wonderful. Another aspect of this, and we've sort of touched on the music industry last night with uh, Gerd, but, um, and the, the cassette was a funny story. My daughter, who's 12, came home from school being asked to do a music project by her school teacher, and over breakfast handed us this cassette. And we all looked at it and thought, what the hell are we going to do with that? You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And one of her friends apparently ended up in her father's car in the front drive because it was the only place they could still find a cassette player. Um, but it was the speed at which that music, the music industry has had all of so much of what they thought they were about just <coughs> cut, cut from under their feet. And the process of disintermediation is going to happen inside corporations as well. So the professionalism that we've done, you know, having professional HR people, professional communications people, professional project people, all this sort of stuff, um, a lot of those middlemen are going to not be needed once people start connecting back with each other. Um, so, you know, I stood up in front of an organisation of PR, uh, sorry, of, of, of communications professionals inside, you know, internal comms and said, you know, at least half of you will be out of a job in, in the next five years. And I don't mean that gleefully, it's just it's, it's, it's going to happen. And it's this thing about middlemen, because it's not that we don't need middlemen. You know, you can, middlemen who add value, who synthesise, who see patterns, who move stuff around, who help people to talk for themselves, will add value. But gatekeeping middlemen, who just stand in the way of things, um, increasingly won't be needed. Uh, another thing that became apparent to me was, was the, the way you bring this stuff about. And there's so many, especially at the moment, there's, you know, social media has turned into a thing, you know, a big thing that people feel they have to do. And there's lots of people who will take money from people to do social media, <coughs> to build tools or whatever. And that pressure is not always a good thing because it turns into initiatives. So you get people having social media done to them. And lots of chief execs being told they have to blog, you know? And it's a bit unkind, but I've started describing watching that happening as like watching your dad dancing at a disco. Um, <laughs> you're, you're kind of proud of him for having a go, but you'd really wish he didn't do it. Um, <laughs> the alternative to that is a principle, and it wasn't original, it was a, a, a kind of KME type guy who came up with the idea of Trojan mice, which I really liked which is little, inexpensive, unobtrusive things that you don't have to ask an awful lot of permission for or get an awful lot of money for, but which, once you set them running, actually begin to find a life of their own and they grow and they start joining up um, and, and you get something productive and worthwhile out of that. And the bit about not spending a lot of money, again, IT has fleeced corporations for millions of pounds over the last 20 or 30 years for, for really very little. I used to sit and watch open plan offices of hundreds of BBC staff sitting staring at beige boxes, using about a fifth of the computing power in front of them and not talking to each other. And you wonder what the ROI on that is, you know? In fact, I wrote a while back, a Scotsman's tip for ROI, keep the eye really small and nobody will give you shit about the R. And uh, <laughs> so that's partly the principle of Trojan Mice. But the other side of it is just the incremental growth of things, the viral growth of things, people finding things worthwhile and growing it by advocacy rather than by diktat. Um, I genuinely, th and, and this is where I think it's not about the technology making this all happen. I think this is something that was happening anyway. You know, I think the big corporates broke the contract. You know, that thing about a job for life where you gave up your soul just to be safe is much less applicable, if at all applicable anymore, if it ever was. But the myth has got broken. So people's attitude to their employers is really changing. And we're having it backed up by a bunch of technologies. <laughs> um, just a kind of concrete example, this was the forum we put in in the BBC 2005, 2006, spent 200 pounds on the software, um, grew it by word of mouth. It didn't get everywhere, not everybody used it, but it eventually had 25, 30,000 BBC staff had access to the system at some time. So getting on for 100% had at least lurked. Um, 
good active 20%, talking about everything from practical stuff, how do I film this, where do I get a fixer in Poland, how do I whatever, to big esoteric stuff about should the BBC have played out Jerry Springer the opera. The whole mix of stuff. Um, another story from one of the clients I've been working with is quite interesting. Mars Confectionery, a food company, put in blogs. And they've, they've got hundreds of people now blogging about food science, packaging, all sorts of stuff. And I'm sure Kirsty won't mind me telling the story, but one of the things that came up that was interesting was they had a blog where the guy was writing a post which he said, I know I'm talking about something difficult. I'm talking about something uncomfortable, but I think it's important that I do so. He was flagging this fact. And everybody who commented on his blog were equally saying, we know this is touchy, but we think it's important. And then Kirsty sent me an email with all of this thread on it saying, I'm really worried. They're all being critical. And I thought it was really interesting how there was a bunch of grown-ups indicating that they wanted to engage seriously talking about an issue, and yet she was still really jumpy about it. Um, it's ironic, given how much I had to push a stone uphill, that you now have the head of World Service saying, all staff have to embrace Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 in a very 1.0 way, you know, they must keep up. Um, equally, people like the M MI5 ditching spies who can't use Twitter or Facebook. You know, whoever would have thunk that when Twitter first came out. Um, last few thoughts. It's easier to build a tool for the community than a community for the tool. I'm really jumping about the word community. Actually, we got the word community taken out of all of our tools because managers talk about forming communities and managing communities. But I always said, no, no, people behave communally if you're very lucky and if you've done very subtle, clever things, so whatever. But people focus on the technology and just ignore the cultural, personal things that it takes to get people to join together on this stuff. Um, this one was, some, somebody tweeted this. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's the crux of a lot of the difficulty. That we're still, I'll read it out for those of you. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. There's an awful lot of people in that circumstance at the moment. And the last one, I was lucky enough to hear Drucker speak, in, uh, the management guru speak in San Diego years ago. And he had this saying, in a knowledge economy, and pardon the language of knowledge management, in a knowledge economy there are no such thing as conscripts, there are only volunteers. The trouble is we've trained our managers to manage conscripts. And I'm going to finish on that note because I think that's the crux of that junction that we're at uh, at the moment.